feel a little bit like I'm the teacher in school. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Joanne Dykeman, and it's a pleasure to be your moderator for this uh, session. It's also just terrific to see the response uh, and interest. I think it's perhaps a topic of mutual interest for many of us as we explore the future of long-term care. We're all looking at what does that clinical leadership look like? What does it need to, to, to be into the future as we actually serve a different population? So um, great to have you here this morning. We have an expert panel with us, and uh, they are absolutely bursting at the seams with information to share. Uh, the panel's large. There's lots of, uh, lots of, <laughs> lots of uh, folk here um, that need to get to know you a bit better. Better. So why don't we start with our panel to introduce themselves, and we'll start with Jonathan. Okay. Can't hear you. Okay. Can we hand held the mic over? I think it's turned off. Oh, we can. Can you take it off? Is it on? Ooh, it's it on. is on. There we go. I'm Jonathan Lam, Senior Methodologist at Health Quality Ontario. Uh, Paul Katz. I'm uh, Vice President of Medical Services and Chief of Staff at Baycrest. I'm Andrea Moser. I'm president of the Ontario Long-Term Care Physicians and associate medical director at Baycrest Apotex. Hi, I'm Christine Dalglish, the VP of Operations for Responsive Health Management. Good morning. I'm Alan Chaniguchi. I'm the medical director at Shalom Village, a long-term care facility in Hamilton, Ontario. Good morning. I'm Laurie Schindel-Martin. I'm associate professor at Ryerson University, Daphne Cockle School of Nursing, and I'm president, Gerontological Nursing Association, Ontario. Very um, uh, impressive panel here. Let's uh, get started. We'll have Jonathan come to the mic and uh, get us started on our conversation. Now, in the interest of the uh, time that we have allowed, uh, we'd like to hold our questions to the end, uh, unless there's something that's really pressing, but we think that might best facilitate the conversation. So, Jonathan? Morning. My con so I think my job today is really to give a backdrop to some of the uh, information that uh, Dr. Katz and Dr. Mosrevi are talking about. So the link between physicians and quality and also some of the results from the OLTCP, Fisherson Survey and Medical Training. So I'm going to be really describing some of the characteristics of long-term care uh, home physicians. So this work that I'll be presenting is based on work that's been done about four years ago based on my master's thesis before I was at Health Quality Ontario. So I'd just like to acknowledge my supervisor, Dr. Susan Bronskill, Jeff Anderson, and uh, Peter Austin for their support. And also I'd like to thank the OLTCA for inviting me and also Dr. Katz and Moser for including me in this presentation. So the motivation behind this study that we did uh, for physicians in long-term care is really that we know that family physicians have a potential to impact uh, long-term care residents on their quality of care, specifically on things like medication, where they have a, a little more control over. But when we looked at the literature, there's very little information out there that quantifies how many physicians are treating long-term care residents and what their characteristics are. So as part of the study, we, our objective was really to characterize family physicians and look at their demographics and practice patterns. So what we uh, used as data for this is really a secondary administrative healthcare databases. We, uh, this data is based in 2005. It's the levels of care data that was used, so this no longer exists, but I think that was one of the last years where we had that data. And it's based on the uh, facility census of long-term care residents at that time. And we included only residents that were greater than or equal to age of 66. And that's mainly because uh, the second part of the study, which I won't be presenting on today, looked at uh, drug use or antipsychotic use and for uh, to link that back to the Ontario Drug Benefits Database, we really needed people who were above the age of 66. So that's why there's that limitation there. So after identifying this cohort of uh, long-term care residents through the census data, we looked at uh, physicians. And to identify those, we used OHIP billing codes. And what we did was we looked at the OHIP billing codes that were for routine long-term care visits. So these were monthly visits, annual checks out, checkups, and what we excluded were emergency visits through OHIP billing codes. And after that, we counted the number, the frequency of codes per resident and the physician who had the most OHIP codes within the last month of the, before the start of the study were identified as the most responsible physician for that long-term care resident. So as what we found was that there were uh, 1,100 and 
90 long-term care uh, family physicians who treated long-term care residents uh, regularly. And that's out of the 10,317 family physicians in 2005. So what we analyzed was we looked at the characteristics of most responsible physicians versus other physicians who were not regularly treating long-term care residents. And we looked at the characteristics of these most responsible physicians by the community size that they practiced in. And finally, we also looked at the distribution of long-term care residents across these uh, physicians who regularly treated long-term care residents. So by that, I mean how many the percentage of uh, residents that were taken care of by each uh, physician. So in terms of findings, I'm just going to quickly go over some of the uh, comparisons between family physicians who were treating long-term care residents frequently versus those that are not. So the uh, MRPs tended to be a little older, so the mean age was 52 in the MRP group versus 48 in the uh, other family physician group. And they were also more likely to have practiced in rural areas. So 24% of MRPs were in rural areas uh, defined as population less than 9,000. And 8% of, the, 8 uh, of uh, other family physicians practiced in this rural area setting. And they're also, they also had a small proportion of practice that were office visits. So within the rural setting, 67% of their practice was based on in, in the office, whereas in the uh, for the family physicians that were not MRPs, theirs was 87% were based in the office. And what we found when we looked at the community size and MRPs, we also found that there were differences across physician practice patterns depending on if they practiced in smaller areas versus more urban areas. So rural uh, MRPs tended to have a more varied practice in general, so they were more likely to uh, go to the ER, they were more likely to visit hospitals, and they also, a higher percentage of them also uh, had obstetric deliveries within the group that practiced in the rural area versus uh, urban areas. So just numbers in terms of uh, the ones, the numbers of uh, ones who practice in the ER, for instance, it was 7.6 in rural uh, physicians versus those who are in the urban settings about uh, po less than 1%, 0.9%, just an example. So next slide here is the uh, Lorenz curve. So what this uh, figure shows here on the X axis in the bottom is the percentage of long-term care physicians. And we ordered them by the number of residents that they treated. So as you go from uh, 0 to 100, that's how many physicians, the percentage of physicians that are accounted for. And on the Y axis are the percentage of long-term care residents that are accounted for. So basically as you go to the right of the graph, you, what you see is the percentage of physicians who are taking care of how the proportion of long-term care residents. So I noticed that during the translation from PowerPoint to PDF, the cross actually moved. <laughs> so what we have here, I don't know if you can hear me, but at this 50% point here is where 50% of physicians are. So what you'll see basically is that at the 50% point, 50% of physicians are taking care of only about 10% of all long-term care residents. Conversely, what you have is 50% of the long-term care physicians taking care of 90% of the long-term care residents. Did anyone hear me okay there, or did I have to repeat that? Okay. So in terms of uh, implications, really what we found is that there are relatively few physicians who are responsible for the care of most of the long-term care residents. So this would have an impact on quality improvement strategies. Do you then target these physicians who are taking care most of these uh, long-term care residents? As, again, specifically to medication use. And there's also a need to understand some of the difference in practice patterns that we talked about. So does it make a difference if a long-term care physician is taking care of 50 residents versus just taking care of 10 in terms of specialization? Are they getting more experience in the more specialized setting? And since that kind of differs from community setting, like that would be an interest to look at to see in the rural setting what's the quality of care versus in the more urban setting where there's more specialized long-term care physicians. And with that, I'll pass it on to Dr. Katz. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, so I'm going to talk about, this has been an interest of mine for many years uh, as I've been in long-term care most of my career. And uh, 
as Jonathan alluded to, we don't we don't know a lot about the relationship between physician practice and quality, but we're, some trends are emerging. Don't I'm not so interested in the numbers on this graph because I'm not sure that that accurate they're that accurate. I moved to um, Toronto about two and a half years ago and have done most of my practice in New York State. So I grab some of these numbers on some typical quality indicators, and it's really just to pose the question, why is there this difference? Is, is it because the nursing home population is different? Is it because the staffing levels are different? Is it because the phys physicians practice differently? Are there different types of physicians? This is one of the driving forces behind the question, uh, actually, of today's panel. Uh, in the U.S., uh, in contrast to what uh, Jonathan was describing for Ontario, we have only one study uh, that we actually did many, many years ago that showed only about 20 percent of primary care physicians uh, engage in care of nursing home residents are, are, are basically equivalent to the MRPs. The majority spend uh, two hours or less per week in nursing home care, and we don't in that survey uh, uh, it's flawed on many uh, many angles. We didn't know how many uh, patients those physicians were caring for. So if you spend two hours a week and take care of three patients, that's not bad. If you have 100 residents, that's probably not so good. Uh, in Ontario, as Jonathan said, we also have a small cohort of uh, physicians, 12% according to Jonathan's numbers, that take care of all of Ontario's residents. We're also, the other trend underlying this that many of you are familiar with is that we have a uh, physician shortage, as many would describe, in long-term care, in long-term care homes. Uh, this is a reference on the last bullet point uh, uh, that there was a 5% decline in general practitioners providing services to long-term care homes. Um, and in the United States, we see a very similar trend. So we already have a shortage, and people are getting older, um, and they're... Um, uh, they're retiring, they're leaving practice, et cetera. So what do we know about the relationship between physician practice per se and quality outcomes? We don't know uh, much. Uh, I'm going to just give you two recent articles that were published by our group that looked at the relationship between how medical staffs are organized and how they relate to the team, how they communicate with nurses, et cetera. That's part of this construct of the nursing home medical staff organization and how it relates with uh, quality indicators. This is one of the first studies we've done. Do I have a pointer on this? Uh, and again, not to, you're not going to be able to see this, but we did start to see some relationship between the uh, this uh, organization, the physician organization, some, some MDS drive quality indicators such as restraint use, pneumococcal vaccine, et cetera. It's, it's not much. It's the beginning, but this is a sort of research that we need to do more of. This was another uh, article uh, published recently that looked at the same uh, construct of nursing home medical staff organization in relationship to 30-day rehospitalizations, which has relevance in terms of this morning's talk from Dr. Oslander on Interact. In fact, the relationship was paradoxical. We, there were seemed to be increased hospitalizations with certain uh, organizational constructs, um, and there are many potential explanations of that. This is another article that appeared in the Journal of American Directors Association um, last, a couple years ago, and I think this will resonate with you here. It looked at factors associated with potentially preventable hospitalizations, exactly what we were hearing this morning, among nursing home residents in New York State. It was uh, about 150 randomly selected nursing homes, and the outcomes were derived from a survey of directors of nursing, uh, MDS-related information, and something they use in, in the states called SPARCs that, that describes staffing levels and organization, structural sorts of things. And what they found, and I think you probably could have predicted this, there were four factors that they found that were associated with reduction in those ambulatory care-sensitive care conditions or potentially preventable hospitalizations. The nursing staff trained to communicate with physicians regarding a condition. We heard that this morning. Physicians treating residents within the nursing home and admitting to the hospitals of last resort. This gets to something we were talking about yesterday at a conference, that physicians who are more... Uh, committed, and I'll get to this in another slide, who are present, or nurse practitioners, or APNs that are present there, who are uh, part of the nursing home culture, that, that that's what you need. It also says that nursing homes that provide information and support to nurses and aides surrounding end-of-life care, advanced directives, we heard that this morning, and easy access to lab results and x-rays. So this is just reinforcing what I think we know. Um, 
That study, uh, I think, substantiates uh, kind of a theoretical construct that we've been trying to make uh, on um, how do you describe uh, the relationship between physicians and quality? And as, as we've seen this, and this, can probably, this is probably not specific to physicians, it's specific to other professionals. There are three critical dimensions. One is a commitment that can be conceptualized as the percentage of the physician's practices devoted to nursing home care. Jonathan explained in Ontario, in increasing a small proportion of patients, of MRPs, are, are devoting more and more of their practice to nursing home. Does that relate to increased quality. I would hypothesize it does, but we don't know that yet. Um, and how much time they're spending with patients. So if you have 500 residents and you're spending 10 seconds with resident and writing a note, that's not good care and that's not commitment. Uh, physician, the other uh, aspect is physician competency defined by specialized training and experience necessary to handle the complex medical care in the highly regulated uh, environment and interdisciplinary care context that is nursing homes of today. Andrew is going to be talking about this in a little bit. And the organiz organizational structure, that is how the medical provider is integrated into the system. So if, if you buy that conceptual framework, you could hypothesize that the quality of the medical practice that's delivered is optimized when you have high competency and commitment in a closed model. Very few physicians, nurse practitioners, APNs delivering most of the care. Conversely, the quality of care would, might be lower in an open staff model where there's low commitment and low competency, yet to be um, uh, proved. The framework would suggest that we can, uh, and there are many pathways, but there may be three, we might want to enhance training and credentialing, i.e. competency. We may want to increase reimbursement, which is one way to increase commitment, probably not the best, and develop, maybe develop new regulatory mandates, God forbid, that should dictate a, uh, a certain organizational model. Um, so this has led to the American Medical Directors Association in the United States that represents over 5,000 nursing home medical directors and attendings to embark um, on a project to develop competencies. Um, and the rationale is what I've been saying. Nursing home practice demands a unique skill set. Uh, it, it, it competencies we think are linked to relevant clinical outcomes and quality. I gave you a few examples. It's also important to develop these competencies because we don't have a lot of credibility. It's not only physicians. Everyone working in nursing homes kind of has low credibility when you compare it to the acute care, the real, the real care. Um, and if we don't set the bar, someone else is going to do it for us. Uh, and, of course, it's going to help inform new curriculum development. Uh, I don't have a lot of time, but these are the sorts of competency statements that are being vetted right now. That the physician demonstrates understanding of ethical principles in the legal regulatory environment is related to clinical decision making and on and on. Um, of course, you know that in, nurse, in, in Netherlands, they've already established a nursing home specialty, and um, that has enhanced credibility to some extent. We think it's also enhanced quality. I think this is a paradigm for Ontario, for Canada, and the United States to follow. Uh, there's a, some natural experiment. I have maybe 30 seconds. Um, Currently in progress in a uh, Life Care Centers of America is a uh, chain of nursing homes, uh, for profit, that has hired f physicians, single physicians, to take on all of the care in their specific homes. Early data, not published yet, suggests that when you have that model, that closed, committed model, that the number of readmissions from the nursing home to the hospital is lower. I did it. Okay. Now, I have to protest that Andrea has a lot more initials after her name than I do. <laughs> I'm going to have to work on that. Thanks, Paul and Jonathan. I had to put the CMD in there because those of you who may not know, the CMD actually stands for Certified Medical Director, which is the training in AMDA. And now I think there's a, hand, a growing handful of us. I think we know of five in Ontario who have that um, certification. So. What we thought, what I've been asked to talk about is um, what's the role of the Ontario long-term care physicians in, in all of this discussion and how can we support? I, 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 for those of you who don't know about our organization and are interested, talk to me afterwards. I can give you a card, a little plug. But we do have a, um, a very strongly attended clinical conference every fall. That's a two-day, it's now expanded to a three-day conference where um, we're now up to 300 medical directors and attending physicians attending that conference. We now have also extended our members membership um, categories to include nurse practitioners and pharmacists recognizing that there's a need for a clinical home for those people who are really developing that strong clinical skill set in long-term care. 
So in 2011, we received some, some funding from Pfizer to um, do a survey of our membership to really dig down into some of the questions around some of the skill sets that we felt were necessary with the, with the new act and with some of the things that have been happening with Health Quality Ontario um, and the Residence First project. Um, we had um, 125 physicians completed the survey, which is really great. We have a member, we have a database of about 500 physicians, but of those 500, almost 200, 250 are members of our organization. So when we actually looked at the response rate, it was 28% from the whole database, but actually from our membership alone, we had 50% of our members responding. So it's a really engaged group of physicians. And we looked at things like years of experience as a medical director. So really interesting. There's a new, it, it's spread out, but there are some really new medical directors who've only been in the field for five years, but there are also are people who've been doing this for over 30 years, so we have a real span of um, experience and skill set. And most physicians, when you ask them, how did you become a medical director, they'll say, well, I was in the nursing home and they needed a medical director and I agreed, but I didn't know what it was about. So part of this survey also was asking some of the things about, some of the things that we're expected to be doing as medical directors. When we look at our contracts, you all know we have contracts with the nursing homes and there, there's a lot of quality improvement in those contracts around evaluation, assessment, working on teams, um, attending, you know, quality improvement team meetings, being involved in the medical staff organization or your professional advisory committees, looking at um, medication safety and medication errors and, and so, so are physicians equipped to do that job. So that was our question. Because we all know physicians are probably the worst in terms of a group of people who if you're in a meeting with a lot of people and you're there with your medical director hat on, you're not going to say, what does that mean? Because you're not going to expose yourself, right? So, so we really, physicians need to have confidence with those tools. So we looked at things like, can you see this slide at the back? So things like um, some of the quality improvement tools that are commonly used, like um, an AIM statement, process mapping, PDSA cycle. If you look at the top bar, which is the light blue, that's the percentage that we're not aware of the tool. So not even not comfortable, but not aware. So 70% for almost most of those quality improvement tools. Yep. Um, I, we didn't break it down into that, but we, we could. Yeah, that's a great question. And then 30% sort of knew about the tools but weren't comfortable. So really this is showing that we have a, a big knowledge gap that we need to be addressing. When we look at in terms of what are these medical directors doing in the homes, how active are they involved, and we looked at things that are required with our contracts and with our acts, the, the orange bar is never. The red bar, unfortunately, it's hard to tell the difference if it's bad coloring, but is all of the time. And then the other ones, the blue and the purple, are sort of sometimes, most of the time. So you look at reviewing admission applications, not happening very much. But looking at infection and control, infection prevention and control, that's what we're more involved with. Reviewing medication errors, that's happening more often. Review of drug utilization, that's happening more often. So it's really, um, really interesting in terms of that split. In terms of what we heard about this morning, reviewing hospital transfers, looking at those transfers, what's happening, some physicians are actually, we had 25% saying that they were doing that all the time. So that's really great. There's physicians out there doing that activity. When we looked at, we then asked them, if you aren't doing it, why aren't you doing it? So we often hear people say the physicians don't care, they're not engaged. Well, that's not what we heard from our physicians. So what we heard was lack of time. So 63% of them said they're so busy with all the other polls on their time, they just don't have that time to sit down. 45% said they weren't aware that the programs were in place. So some of these programs are happening in the nursing homes and the, the medical director might not even be included in the loop or might not even have been invited to the table. But then if you look at the bottom, what's circled, it's they're, they're, they've really identified lack of skill in program development, lack of training in quality improvement as a big barrier to their involvement at the home. So that started us looking at what are the needs of physicians who are medical directors working in nursing homes. And we came up with a list of what our college sort of looks at perceived needs and unperceived needs. So what do we all know that we need to know? And what do we don't know that we need to know? And really, when you ask physicians just an open-ended question about what do they need to do their work better, they clearly talked about what's the role of the medical director, legislation, communication, complex clinical issues, but they actually, even after answering the survey saying, I don't know about quality improvement tools, they actually didn't say they needed 
that was so we pulled that out as what we call an unperceived need around the quality improvement and the program management um, skill set. So we started looking at medical director training. How can we do that? We do a clinical conference every year, but how do we get that medical director piece, that administrative component? Um, and and we there's no curriculum currently targeting that skill set um, in Canada. And so we looked um, what else is out there, and the American Medical Directors has a really um, well-established um, curriculum in medical direction and long-term care that once you complete the training and then you do some other things, you then can be um, eligible for a certified medical director. And that course is 46 hours of intensive work. So we looked at how, how can that work in Ontario, um, and so we're currently in the process of looking at building that curriculum that the medical directors that currently are in the province can attend, looking at things like understanding the system. So legislation, regulations, organizational responsibilities of the medical director. What's your relationship with the director of the care, of director of care, the board, um, interdisciplinary teams? What are the resident care responsibilities of the medical director? So what's our role as medical director in terms of emergency care, medication management, and Infection control, quality around advanced care planning and ethics. Do we have a role with the RI and with the MDS? Should we be drilling into and looking at some of those indicators that are coming out? And I think John Hurdies is speaking this afternoon on that. Do we really understand our contract? When we start having discussions with our members about the contract and what you're actually saying you're going to do for the organization on your two hours a week you have to do it, you really have to look at is that possible. And then the relationship between the long-term care homes and our broader healthcare environment. We're really moving away from all the different silos. So how do we really present as long-term care a viable, important part of the system? Yes, I'm a real doctor, even though I only practice in long-term care. How many times do you hear that from a resident? Oh, we yeah, have about my real doctor. Well, I'm a real doctor too. And I went to medical school to work in long-term care, so I'm a strange real doctor. Um, and then the part two of the medical director curriculum that we're, we're building is around the leadership and management skills. So the communication, negotiation, facilitating, how do you work with teams, how do you work with families, how do you support some of those families that are really having challenging times, and, and what's the role of the medical director there? How do, how do you make sure that we're acquiring new knowledge and um, translating that knowledge into our homes? How do we bring those new guidelines? How do we make sure we're, we're involved with the quality improvement that is happening and then the implementation of all the policies and everything that we know we have to do in long-term care? Um, and I think that's the end of my slide. So are we on time? We're on time. Great. Woohoo. Coming up together. Okay. Now, how do I get out? I'm never good with this. Oh, just escape it. Oh. Okay, pardon me. There we go. No. What's going on? Maybe it's not. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Where is it? Slide it There. Okay. Very good. Okay, so Alan and I are going to model uh, collaboration, and uh, this is going to be an in-the-moment collaboration that is just like how we would practice together um, in the long-term care um, setting. Um, I should mention that Alan and I have worked together for a, a long time. Um, when I was at St. Peter's Hospital as a clinical nurse specialist, Alan was one of the um, physicians that um, we collaborated. He had a caseload. It was really wonderful to have access to uh, such a fine thinker. Um, and then at Shalom Village, um, Alan um, is, uh, is the medical director, and uh, um, I was the clinical nurse specialist at Shalom Village for eight years, and we had many discussions, collaborative discussions, around uh, practice issues, enhancements, as well as clinical cases. So what we're going to do is uh, talk to you about what interprofessional care looks like 
um, what it could look like in long-term care. We're going to be talking about some of the benefits to interprofessionality, and then we're going to talk about a case study application. We're going to have a dialogue back and forth. So, Ellen. So uh, I'm just going to take one step back just to get a sense of who is here with us today in this room. So how many of you are long-term care clinicians of some shape or form? So maybe, what, a quarter of you? Uh, how many are um, administrators, managers? Okay, so about a quarter as well. Uh, policy people? Okay. Researchers. Uh, researchers. Any students? Educators, students. Okay. Did did I miss any large group of people in the room? Phar pharmacists. Okay. Well, I I guess I consider you a clinician as well. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So as you can imagine, it's it's a challenge to give you everything you might want to know about collaboration in 20 minutes. So that was kind of the daunting task that Laurie and I were faced with. And so what we thought we would do is just uh, scratch the surface, perhaps, of some things that you might want to think about related to collaboration in the long-term care setting. And we're hoping that we'll have a lot of time during the larger panel discussion to uh, get deeper into some of that um, uh, thought. Uh, one of the things that we thought we would just mention is that, of course, long-term care and care of the elderly is an ideal type of practice setting uh, which lends itself to interprofessional collaboration. And when you think about care of the elderly, these three words on the screen uh, suggest that the nature of our work, right? We're often dealing with situations where there is high degree of uncertainty, uh, that there is a lot of variability in what we see with our residents. And uh, they can, in fact, be unstable uh, many of the times, or perhaps subtly unstable. Uh, and we heard uh, earlier today from Dr. Oslander about how it's important for us to identify early uh, people who are changing and becoming unstable. So you can imagine in a clinical setting where these sorts of factors are at play, having a whole team approach to providing care to those individuals is likely to be a more effective uh, mechanism to provide that care. Uh, Lori and I are just going to bounce back and forth, so you may get a bit of whiplash as we kind of just interrupt <laughs> each other, but we're used to kind of doing that with one another. So. Okay. And we're, and we're used to standing like this, just in the threshold of a, of a doorway, right? <laughs> or out inside the hall and just going, what, what do you think about this? What does this mean? What does this clinical finding mean? What are your thoughts about it? And invariably... Our issues were not so much instability of, of the, the resident client. It was frequently the instability and the conundrums around family um, and how to work with the family to support them and how to support the staff as they supported the families. So our dialogue was often trying to find things that were reasonable approaches, um, reasonable approaches that would not result in um, uh, mutiny or uh, with the introduction of a new practice idea, for example, um, how to do things in a way that would sustain best practice around a specific case. Um, would, would you agree? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so most of the time, um, with, with our preoccupation with the science of our practices and uh, evidence-based practice, I was looking back in my notes on some of the cases that, that you and I used to dialogue about. Um, it was around the time where we had our Long-Term Care Best Practice Resource Center open up, and we had such fantastic access, almost for the first time, um, that we could get easy access to literature. And you and I had always had access access to McMaster uh, Library through our own sources, but not in being able to get it at, at, at the workplace, to look at something, print it out, and kind of go, ah. And frequently we would talk about the fact that there was never an article that said, hello, Alan, Lori, here's the answer to your problem. And unfortunately, the answers were not evident. And um, we would have to sort it through, unpack it, and have a dialogue in order to figure out what to do, how to make a decision around this case. 
And I think that's where the power of collaboration comes. So if you think about what collaboration is, uh, Way and Jones suggest that interprofessional collaboration is a interprofessional process for communication and decision making where the separate and shared knowledge and skills of the care providers synergistically come together to influence care being provided. But the key about collaboration is this whole idea that collaboration is there to help you make clinical decisions. And so really one of the things you want to try and achieve in your collaboration is this joint decision-making process. Uh, so hence, these kind of uh, vague situations where answers are not obvious lend themselves very well to the collaborative process. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, these are uh, some of the characteristics of interprofessional collaborations that ideally we want to try and achieve collaborations which are client-centered. They're comprehensive in terms of examining all the factors that are impacting on how we might approach that, those scenarios. Uh, ultimately, I think we'd like to d have some demonstration of cohesive thinking. Um, now, I would suggest that practitioners might start at different points, right? So we might all have slightly different ideas about what should be done. Lori and I may start very differently in terms of how we think we should help a particular resident. Uh, but eventually, through continuous dialogue and a consensus building approach, we hopefully ultimately come up with some cohesive thinking, some coherent thinking about what is going on and what should we do uh, in order to respond to whatever concern we have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think the, the the issue of collaboration as well, um, uh, um, this seems to be all C-oriented. Um, uh, communication, yes. we could add to this list. This is from Demore and um, Anderson, as well as um, uh, uh, commitment that I heard um, Paul speaking about. Um, I, I think commitment could be inferred in the continuous dialogue. Obviously, you have to be committed to go over and over and over cases to tr be, because the variability, the, the, the dialogue needs to be continuous because it's not uh, an answer that will divulge itself or emerge after one conversation frequently. And I think that um, uh, one of the advantages and, and the luxuries of working with, with Alan has been how approachable um, to having an of-the-moment conversation. I have an idea. I read this. What do you think about this? Flipping an article and then having, oh, you know, that, that's, that's, that's a good idea. Um, but what about this? What about this spin on it? So I think having that exchange is a really critical piece um, as well. It's funny. We were, I, I was also trying to think of extra C words to add on to that slide. And the thing that came up to me is um, perhaps something like uh, concern and compassion for mm. your teammates. Yeah. Because I think much of what uh, collaboration depends upon is having mutual trust and respect for one another. And that allows you to have some sort of foundation to have challenging conversations at times. Uh, it, it lets you tolerate differences of opinion. So I think that uh, effective working relationships, but because R doesn't, relationship doesn't start with a C, I, I'm going to call it <laughs> concern and compassion yeah. for one another. Uh, yeah, I, I, I agree with that. Um, th this is an early model of uh, collaborative uh, uh, patient-centered practices. Uh, from the literature, and, and we, we pull this in because it does nicely illustrate how complex this is. We all know that the actual clinical uh, practice world in long-term care is, it is complex uh, older person's care. And of course it would require some kind of infrastructure that recognizes how many different variables we have to navigate as collaborators. There are systems issues. There are human resource issues. There are financial, social capital issues. Um, just time issues. We really need your presence at this family meeting. How to schedule it when everyone is available. 
because the dialogue and the, the modeling the collaboration for other members of the team and the family is as critical as making a recommendation for the care. Um, the dialogue has to be modeled. So I think that's one of those main issues from a systems time perspective, um, uh, variabilities with the, with the patients, with the residents as well. Uh, when, I don't know about you, but when I look at this model, it's, it's, it makes me kind of spin. So the, uh, some yeah. people fondly refer to this model as a CD, because it, it does look like a CD, the CD model. So my head kind of just spins in terms of all the factors and uh, pieces that go into effective collaboration. So what we did is we found a com somewhat more simple way to think about collaboration. The, the slide specifically talks about decision making, but it's this idea that there are all sorts of uh, somewhat amorphous pieces and elements that are all jumbled together that you as a team, uh, your, the physicians and nurses are trying to work together to solve. Uh, there are all sorts of factors and ways to organize that information and some of the things you might think about are um, what is best practice or evidence informed uh, decision making? How are you currently practicing uh, as a team? Uh, what individual experiences have you all had that impact on what you think might be best in a given situation? What are clients and families wanting in terms of their care at that particular point? And all these forces, of course, somehow hopefully come together to fit into a, a puzzle coming together and, and actually come together in a way that give you a way forward and give you action. Uh, so that you can align those factors in a way that actually allows you to make those effective decisions and to achieve what you're hoping to achieve. Mm -hmm. um, further to some of the points that I made this morning, I, I would have to say that solid interprofessional collaboration is a huge element in work-life quality and satisfaction that will impact on recruitment and retention in the long-term care sector. I really believe that. Having talked to so many students over the course of the last six years who have various and, and sundry clinical practice um, uh, experiences as students, they'll come to me and say, you know, one of the best experiences I had. I wish I'd known that this would be like this uh, because I sort of dug my heels in and didn't want to go to a nursing home for my uh, fourth year placement. But I really understood for the first time how continuous dialogue is so essential to meet the fluctuation of a, a, a particular human being's condition as they progress through a chronic illness, for example. And it's the people around the edges who really capture our attention. What I mean by that are, is people and families, residents who have are, are sort of enigmas. Um, they may have exceptional health care needs. They may be very highly complex. The people in the middle, our, our, our practices are, are, are good for them. It's the people on the edges that we're going, oh, we don't know what to do about this specific thing because it's elements that are unusual. That's where the collaborative practice is so absolutely essential. And I think it provides that whole notion of demonstrating how um, one can have a, a, a tolerance and, in fact, welcome opposing viewpoints about how to look after that very challenging case. And I think that, 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 that that's one of the things that we've done a pretty good job with, I think, is, is modeling that for, for teams. And I think earlier there were some comments uh, in the plenary about uh, recruitment and retention and magnet, uh, long-term care homes, et cetera. And certainly those homes that have effective collabor collaboration within them, I think are definitely places that, you know, certainly I would want to work. So one of the reasons why I like working in the place I work is because I do feel that we have uh, a great deal of collaboration and, and as I've said, that mutual trust and respect which allows us all to not, o not only um, provide better care but uh, also to um, enjoy the work in terms of job satisfaction.
Now, um, uh, I, I'm just going to quickly comment about, um, well, Alan, why don't you quickly comment about the, the clinical benefits, and then I think we'll just go to the case. Okay. Yeah. I, I think you probably all can recognize at some intuitive or intellectual level that collaboration, when uh, clinical scenarios are complex or ambig ambiguous or uncertain, uh, that bringing together of these different perspectives, of course, allows you to have a richer way of problem solving. And so I, I would suggest that, you know, perhaps the single most uh, notable benefit of collaboration from a clinical perspective is you actually come up with better solutions by putting, you know, more brains together. Mm -hmm. um, and ultimately, I think that enhances care for the client, the family, and uh, as I've already mentioned, kind of enhances work a place satisfaction for the team. Mm -hmm. um, so um, we have an ambiguous case. Um, this uh, um, case is uh, Ruby, uh, Mrs. W, daughter, substitute decision maker, son lives out of the country and is intermittently invo uh, involved, particularly if there is a sudden um, decline. Um, and we'll call and we will all be in a conference room together on the speakerphone and the son will say, my expectation is that my mother will survive. Um, despite the fact that she has a very advanced disease state, has had aspiration pneumonia already twice, and has a very large decubitus ulcer that um, will not heal. Um, looking at the Breyer, uh, Elizabeth Breyer stages, um, this is a person at the very end of their life, um, and they will die. So our concern as a clinical team is how to assist the staff because the family is going to be, um, they're going to be an uncertain variable at the point that despite all our good work, um, supporting the family, educating them, listening to their concerns, the point of care staff come to us and say, we're not sure what to expect at the moment that Ruby dies. And we're anticipating the family are going to change their mind and ask us to do everything right then. What do we do? So um, one of the things that we've done um, together is just look at various scripts and work out together from both of our lenses, um, uh, myself as a, as a nurse, Alan as a physician, with that lens, what could we assist the staff? So we give them like a script of what to say, because this is probably going to happen, isn't it? on a Sunday at 10 o'clock at night when we're not in the building. So these are the kinds of things that we've tried to develop. So um, looking at this, Ellen and I would have a conversation and go, okay, so, you know, the first thing is to acknowledge the emotion behind the family's upset. Do something. My mother has to live. Um, so rather than picking up the blower immediately and calling you, um, and saying, can you talk to the family and explain over again what, which isn't going to help in the context? So, what are what are your thoughts when you read that? Is that going to? So, Alan and I would go, okay. Um, does that make sense? Is there something that we could write for them that they could say back to the family and practice that? What do you think as you see that? We've got two minutes to. This is our last slide. <laughs> So you're you're asking here about yeah. the right hand column. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if you can even read that from where you are, Mrs. X. It seems like you and your family are very concerned about your mother's condition, and that you are a lot of you are under a lot of pressure right now. So again, I think it's just giving helping staff have some words to okay. interact with families. And yeah. when do you think we should have them say that? Because I just, Alan, I'm just imagining that, that the daughter and the son, all that tension that they have, the, the, the nurses are going to be at the bedside and they're going to be seeing this tension. And do you think that that would work? Do you think that they would be able to do that? Are you seeing what, how we would have this dialogue? What, what do you think? Yeah, I think so. I think the key is going to be for staff to know uh, when they should take that 
conversational tact with the family. Okay. Um, and I think we might need to help staff know when this type of conversation might be needed, okay. right? Um, okay. So we might have to paint some more detailed scenarios for them about that. Okay. So um, what we've tried to do here is model how we would have a conversation, involve staff ultimately, because sometimes these ideas, they might kind of go, what kind of goofy idea is that, a script? Um, on the other hand, with us having something tangible to bring to them, to work with us on, it's it's very helpful for us to be able to do those kinds of things. So, any last points that you wanted to make? Uh, yeah, I think I think you know collaboration is always a process, and so there's not really a single right way to have kind of collaboration. And each of you in your own homes, in your own contexts, etc., will find that certain mechanisms work better for you in terms of team dynamic and team function. Uh, so I think some of it is just taking a step back sometimes from the day-to-day -day care to try and figure out what is it that you could do to enhance collaboration. I think sometimes we're just so swept up in actually providing direct care as a group that we don't think about these bigger elements that are impacting us in perhaps more subtle ways. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Like, can we consider the impending transition? Now, what we need to do is be direct and say, can we consider what we're going to do as your mom begins to die? Absolutely. Have that conversation. That needs to be, the nurse needs to know the physician support them. Absolutely. Absolutely, uh, and, and I would agree 100% that this this is this is such a very general script. It, you can see it says um, tailored that that uh, the whole script needs to be tailored to the situation, and uh, I would agree that it needs to be um, clear um, uh, about that dialogue and and, uh, and communication. So thank you for raising that point. Thank you. And we're going to bring uh, Chris Daglish up now to. Uh, Pose a reflection from the uh, director of care perspective on clinical leadership. So good morning, everyone. I've actually been asked to give um, the uh, Director of Care's perspective really from an operational perspective. So just in terms of responsive health management, we have five long-term care homes. Four are actually in the downtown uh, core of Toronto, and one is actually in Barrie. It's a new long-term care home um, in Barrie, 160 beds. Uh, we have 780 long-term care home beds. Our smallest is 108 beds, and our largest is 218 beds. Just to give you an idea in terms of the turnover in the last five years with the Director of Care, not sure if it's the same in other organizations, but in our organization, it's probably about every two years. And I would say that that has happened in the last five years. Previous to that, I, uh, we would have actually seen the turnover be somewhere between five and eight years, and oftentimes it wasn't as a result of the Director of Care leaving the home. It was the Director of Care moving into an administrator role. So we're no longer seeing that to the same extent as what we used to see it. So just in terms of the role of the Director of Care, and I'm sure there's many Director of Cares in this room, so you can, you know, jump in any time in case I missed part of your role. <laughs> but uh, in terms of the role, administrative responsibilities. So, you know, I think it's important that we understand amongst all of this, we have to do this. This, this is the real wor world for long-term care. So administrative would be high-intensity needs. So for those of you that are familiar with that, you have to sub do the submission for high-intensity needs. Then you have to do the reconciliation when you receive the money from high-intensity needs. So that's a challenge. Uh, directors of care also sit on a number of different um, uh, committees within the home. So in our homes, we have a leadership committee. We also have a joint director of cares 
um, uh, committee, which um, um, is on a monthly basis, plus you have the quality and risk committee as well. Clinical accountabilities, um, uh, all director of cares have to oversee the required programs through the uh, uh, Ministry of Health, so required programs are skin and wound, falls program, continence program, responsive behaviors program, um, uh, pain program, end of life care. So, you know, those are the responsibilities of, of that particular individual. All of you are familiar with compliance. So you've got the new Long-Term Care Homes Act and you've got the regulations with that as well. Quality and risk, we've got uh, the Residence First program. Uh, we also have um, all of the indicators that you look at, so your falls, your skin, your wound, your con or, uh, continence. So you need to keep an eye on those, the analysis, the trends of that particular information. You have financial accountabilities. For some organizations, uh, they are accountable for their budgets, for their variance reports, for special funding that comes in. Uh, so you've got your RPN funding, you've got your Rye coordinator funding, and then, you know, right now, uh, although we're absolutely thankful from the ministry for the extra funding, we've got to find ways to spend that funding in a short period of time. Uh, human resources, you've got retention, you've got recruitment, you've got absenteeism, you've got grievances, you've got labor management. And under advocacy for residents and families, of course, on, on an ongoing basis, we're dealing with that, um, whether it be a family concern, whether it be um, the analysis of the satisfaction survey for both employees or for um, the for um, sorry the residents themselves. So some of the challenges in terms of clinical leadership that we're seeing in our organization. So understanding the long-term care homes environment. As I mentioned to you before, we're not necessarily seeing. In our organization, we used to have the day nurse manager position, and we still do have that position, but we've had turnover in that position. So then when that position usually was the opportunity for that individual to move into the director of care role. So we're not seeing that to the same extent that we used to. So lots of times understanding the long-term care environment, they got that experience by being in the nurse manager role. You're not seeing that as much any longer. So you really need, it is a uh, unique environment as all of you know. There is the Long-Term Care Homes Act and the regulations. There is a lot to know. So understanding that environment is an area that we see um, requires a lot of uh, a strength. There's some, some improvement in for sure. Leadership skills, I think, you know, this has come up from everyone. I mean, the panel has already mentioned that communication, interprofessional collaboration, understanding your staff, being able to keep your pulse on um, all of the things that you have to keep your pulse on, but at the same extent, extent you can't be uh, too involved with it because you just don't have the time to be able to do that. So understanding what the risk is and being able to identify that is really, really important. Uh, clinical competencies, again, if you haven't been in the nurse manager role, you've got quite a learning curve in terms of the required programs. So as I mentioned to you before, skin and wounds, you've got continence, you've got pain, you need to understand what those programs are and you need to make sure that they're happening on your units. Strategic planning, just from the perspective of really being a much higher thinker, having a vision for the department and what does that look like. Quality and risk. Quality and risk is, is huge. It has really changed, um, certainly with uh, public reporting. You need to understand those indicators. You need to do analysis with those indicators. It is the director of care that's looking at that on an ongoing basis. So you need some experience in terms of understanding that. Human resource skills, this is a real area that we, we find that uh, more um, training and education needs to be done. So, you know, labor management, grievance, understanding the collective agreement, being able to do retention and recruitment, interviewing staff for positions because you do have turnover. Financial management, same thing. Oftentimes, and no offense to all the nurses in this room, I'm sure some of you are fabulous at financial management, but it is an area that we don't tend to like that much. We tend to like clinical more than we like financial. <laughs> However, we do it. <laughs> so certainly, you know, an opportunity to strengthen that. And advocacy and family and resident concerns. So if there's an allegation of resident abuse, it is the director of nursing who's doing that investigation and following that process and making sure the CIS goes into the ministry, et cetera. So there is a lot with the uh, role itself, and these are some of our challenges that we've had in our organization. 
In terms of strengthening it, I, I know the panel has already mentioned this. I, you know, I can't stress enough the need for the nursing cur curriculum to really reflect leadership as a dimension of practice. Um, it's, it's, it's just critical to what we're seeing on the front lines and the need for, for good leadership skills. And I think it's important to recognize that as a director of care, it's, you, you can't do it alone. You do it in conjunction with a whole team. So if the rest of the team is not functioning from a leadership perspective, then it, 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 it ends up being, you know, a vicious circle, really, in terms of the director of care and her role within the organization. I think it's really important to recognize and, um, one of the panelists already mentioned that, the need for a specific educational uh, program for directors of care in long-term care. It is a specialty. It does have its own training requirements, and I think it's something we need to focus on. We focus on that with ICU and with emergency care. I think long-term care is its own specialty for sure. The, you know, the need for lifelong leadership development, it's so crucial. It's not just... Like yesterday when I was at one of the presentations, one of the gentlemen said, education isn't an event, it's a process. And it's very, very true. You can't just go to one leadership seminar and all of a sudden think you're going to be a leader. You know, you need practice as well as you need the knowledge and the education. Ongoing training courses specific to the DOC role, career opportunities in long-term care. I mean, there is an opportunity for many young nurses to move into long-term care. You know, and I think for many of us in this room, that have been in long-term care for as long as we have, you know, it, it, it really is a profession in itself, and it's an awesome profession. And we need to start encouraging younger people to want to be in long-term care and not just acute. Um, providing opportunities in the workplace to add supervisory experience. In our organizations, as I said to you, the nurse manager, day nurse manager role used to be the role that we would move into the director of care position, and that's really kind of changed for us. But I think there's a real opportunity to grow your own within uh, long-term care homes. I think it is an opportunity, really, for nurses to um, be able to move into a different level. I mean, we've always grown our own, uh, uh, you know, Know, staff in long-term care and move them into different positions when we've seen the opportunity for them to uh, move forward. Uh, funding to support orientation of new DOCs. I mean, you know, I know not, not that I want to complain about funding because <laughs> I was told this morning I couldn't complain about it from Dr. Oslander, so I won't complain about it. But, <laughs> you know, I don't know about you, but we all struggle with orientation and education in long-term care and the replacement of those particular people in order to get them out to be able to um, support some of the education that really needs to be happening in long-term care. Research, I would love to see someone really take a look at the role of the director of care and, you know, what, what, is, what should be the role of the director of care? What are they doing in other countries and other provinces? And how can we adapt some of that to what we do here in Ontario? And then, most importantly, succession planning. I mean, we are an aging population. We need to make sure that um, we have uh, the right people in the right place. Um, in terms of those staff and, and, and grow them within our own home. Or, you know, it's becoming harder and harder to recruit, and it will be because many of the boomers will want to retire, and so those younger people will have to take on those roles and look after people like us. So, <laughs> so thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, speaker, but the entire uh, panel. Let's actually give another warm uh, round of applause. Just a tremendous amount of information that was shared, and in quick order, I might add as well. So, trying to get the timing right, just to to see, um, you know, how much is to be shared and what time you have is always a trick as well. So, I appreciate your flexibility there. Uh, a comment, maybe, and then we'll uh, start right into your questions. Uh, Chris talked about the director of care role, and there's been a very keen interest in that role for some time to take a look and explore that. And one of the things that the association has done, who's, uh, who's behind the chair of this uh, Applied Research Education Day, is to create a networking meeting tomorrow for the directors of care, or previous directors of care, or wannabe directors of care. You're all welcome. Tomorrow we have a meeting, um, a networking meeting, and we've got guests that are coming to that meeting. One of uh, the guests is uh, uh, a group from the States, uh, 
called NADANA, which is the National Association for Directors of Nurses. And this is a group that we're familiar with in some of our organizations, and we wanted to invite them here to Canada to talk about nursing leadership. What is the role of the director of nursing? How can that how can we create networks around directors of nursing? How can we look at credentialing that position? How can we look at recognizing it, supporting it, advancing the nursing leadership practice? There are many agencies in Canada that do different work towards nursing, uh, gerontological nursing. This particular, perhaps, um, lens at this leadership level is not currently in place. So we welcome Nadana to uh, Ontario. Uh, they'll be presenting. Uh, they've got a booth here. Maybe you've already seen them in the, in the, uh, the booth area. And I invite you to attend that session tomorrow as well to continue the conversation. So uh, thank you, uh, Chris, and everyone. At this time, I would like to open up further, though, the opportunity for your questions. Uh, we heard some really engaging conversations around clinical phys um, physician leadership. I know there's been a, a keen uh, interest to try to understand how do we engage our physicians more collectively and uh, with synergy across the system. Our model has often been, and, and Paul and I spoke about this yesterday, a decentralized model for physician care. You know, tremendous committed physicians working at a lot of sites, but our collective voices together hasn't always been uh, well organized, or at least we feel it's missing. So we are so eager to hear some of the work that's going on in that area. Um, the work of uh, the collaborative models, whether it be nurse, physician, or all the other disciplines, trying to advance interprofessional practice. Certainly we're right that the, the time is needed, so let's hear your questions around the topics that were shared. What uh, jumps out at you? What resonated with you with what you heard? What questions do you have? And we do have a mic to actually help the dialogue. Okay, please. Uh, you need the mic. You're, they're going to have that mic, and I'll hand you my mic. A mic made for much taller people than me. Um, I'm Natalie Damiano from Kai High, just to sort of put that right out there. Um, and I'm really interested to hit all of the talks this morning, and I know Andrea and Paul, we've spoken about this before. On a couple of recent panels I've been on, when we're looking at using things like the quality indicators to look at accountability, we've heard from a number of long-term care homes, not just in Ontario, that we can't use things like rate of antipsychotic use as a measure of accountability for long-term care homes because physicians are responsible for that. So the home can't be held accountable. Would be interested in your comments, thoughts, and how do we move forward there? We just put out a paper to show that our antipsychotic rates across Canada are awfully high. One in three residents is on antipsychotics. I'll try to take it. I think one of the issues I know we, can you hear me? One of the questions we had about some of the some of the data points are what is it actually telling you? So I know there's um, some of the quality indicators say antipsychotics without an appropriate indication. So again, you have to look at what does that mean and what are we telling people? We we have challenges. There's there's certain practice and clinical guidelines and um, best practice around use of antipsychotics, and that's something that we do with our organization in terms of education every year on our at our conference. There's always either a workshop or a plenary or something on antipsychotics. I think the concern about report Reporting it, and some of those indicators where it's specific to physician prescribing, that you end up having a privacy issue in terms of a physician, a, a specific physician's practice is then being publicly reported. So if there's homes where they only have one physician and one medical director, that's where it gets that's where it gets tricky. But um, I would I would actually challenge that one of the things that we find or at least I find sitting at different committees with ONUS and OLTCA and at the ministry is that we often have this language around staff in nursing homes. And I think this is one of the challenges we had with the Residents First project is that the staff in nursing homes were targeted for that education and too often the physician or the pharmacist aren't actually included in that word staff. So we end up creating that disconnect. So I think we have to look at how we language around you know, who is responsible for that antipsychotic um, prescribing in nursing homes is not just the physician. It's the whole team, and it's the whole interdisciplinary approach, and that's where you get into collaboration saying, hey, guys, we've got 35% of our residents are on antipsychotics. We need to look at that. Who's, who's, who's responsible and who's 
you know, who, who's involved in, in all that and how can we improve that? So that's where that whole lead of collaboration and interprofessional practice and quality improvement and all that happens. No, I just, uh, it is, I thought it was reportable. Isn't antipsychotics yeah. without indication? So it's reportable through things like high-high health quality necessary. It has to do with the accountability agreement. And it was really the concept, this is what I understood, so yeah, that logic uh, means that the home has no control over the medical director, who then controls medical policies, which doesn't make sense either. So no. it maybe needs to be tested. Uh, it does raise a question, though, of, of on the physician perspective. Uh, how do you measure physician performance? And this is a whole other uh, several-hour talk probably. But, uh, you know, this is a good example. If we use uh, MDS-derived quality outcomes, how many of them are physician-specific? Some of the, the uh, articles I showed you that we were involved in, we had a really tough time uh, looking. We tried to pick ones like antipsychotic use or restraint use or vaccination rates. But as Andrea just said, those decisions are really uh, team decisions in a lot of ways, uh, fam how the families want things on, et cetera. So it's very difficult. There, there are some, and I would advocate that we start to think of more process measures uh, as uh, when we talk about quality. Uh, and it would not only apply to physicians, it would apply to other professionals. Um, that is, you know, you're going through the right process or you're thinking of the right things. We, all, we heard examples this morning about how we can't prevent falls all the time, but did we take the appropriate measures and steps to prevent them? That's what we should be uh, gauged on, not necessarily only the outcomes. Other questions from the audience? Well, I'm going to actually try another one on uh, Paul. You shared with us... Um, some data that compared uh, U.S. MDS outcomes and Canadian uh, aggregate uh, MDS outcomes. They were significantly different. You stated you weren't sure why just yet, but you practiced in both U.S. and Canada now. Do you have any insights at all? Because it was quite startling, you know, to see the range of outcome differences between the two, the two countries. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. It depends on the uh, outcome measure you're talking about. Because as we all know that homes don't track necessarily consistently on each outcome. You may do very well on one quality measure and not do well on another. So there's that inconsistency. Uh, I do think that the differences between not only Canada and the United States but amongst uh, many countries uh, is based on probably all the factors we're talking about. Um, nurse, nursing staff, uh, you know, hours per patient per day. The, the competency of the nurse and other professional staff, the availability of physicians, the regulatory environment. I think maybe some of those differences may be regulatory in origin. I think um, when I came here, I was impressed. Um, you're not going to like this, but um, <laughs> I think um, your Canada and particularly Ontario is catching up to the regulatory fervor, the paranoia that I've lived with in New York in the United States for many years. That may not be a good thing necessarily, but it's becoming, uh, I was feeling, I feel the same tension here that I felt for most of my career in the United States. Um, and that, that may be driving some of those, uh, some of those issues. The, the, the restraint use is one particular one. Right, we see quite a, a significant yeah. difference there for sure. I, I maybe just mention one thing, uh, Joanna. The, um, we were we alluded to this already, but yesterday we had a um, a, a day session sponsored by the Learning Centers for Learning Research and Innovation, and we were talking about what we were all alluding to is uh, we're, we're kind of in a crisis. Our field is in a crisis. Whether you're talking about nurses or pharmacists or physicians or APNs, we, we're not able to attract uh, the young professionals who want to make this a career. Um, and I think one of the things we talked about yesterday was how do we change that paradigm? And we really need to convince um, the, uh, the universities, the community colleges, that when they're training professionals, they need to assure, and this includes nursing schools and medical schools particularly, that trainees are exposed to long-term care in the right environment, 
not every long-term care environment would be ideal for training, but there many are, many that you represent here in this room. So we need to expose um, trainees to the right environment so they can get excited about the sort of collaboration that we heard about this morning, which, which really is unique in, in, in care. You don't see that in the acute hospital that much. And we need to have the right role models that we've seen here this morning so people can get excited about this. And then we develop a curriculum around that. And then, uh, you know, that's, that's part of it. We have, we have a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm. uh, on a system level. Laurie, yes, I was going to pose that question back over to you because we had an interesting conversation this morning. Mm. Well, um, uh, one of the things that uh, um, you may be aware of is that there there is an organization called OICA, which is a collaboration of universities in Ontario, and that collaboration is looking at um, bringing forward uh, curricular points and embedding it in a very particular way in all the professional training schools. Um, uh, at one point, Larry uh, Chambers was the chair of that group, um, and uh, uh, there are a number of physicians who sit on that um, group. There are social workers, there's a representative from pharma pharmacy, um, nursing, um, and general gerontology programs as well. And one of the things that we're trying to look at is how do we introduce even some pilot studies at various schools that have a purpose-built curriculum that includes main curricular points, um, uh, not just threaded, but ha and have very specific courses. Um, of course, we all graduate generalists from the, the baccalaureate level, um, but the, the dilemma is that the demographics are such that for the majority of these students, they're going to be working with older adults. Mm -hmm. So we have an obligation to ensure that the curricula are rich with case studies, but key curricular points that will assist them to be better practitioners at the point of graduation. Other members on the panel want to comment further on that piece? or I, I just wonder if we also need to so we're having a discussion about what's the medical director training, what's the director of care training, and if you map those beside each other, there's a lot of overlap. So I think probably long-term care is, and this is just, I'm thinking as after sitting here listening, I think long-term care is probably a great opportunity for some really significant interprofessional education when when we're and I found that with the residents first walking through we've been discussing with HQ for two years but how can we get the physician training for residents first and there was all this discussion about well what does it need to look like and how do we need to do it and I attended the improvement facilitator training for two days I said well you've got it Yes, that's right. what we need to know. We don't need right. to know something different. We need to know the same language. We need to do the same things. You've got case studies that are relevant for physicians. So I think sometimes we're probably overthinking that there's a lot of things that are very common in terms of our approaches to care. What do I need to know about an acute change in status? What does the registered nurse need to know? What does the RPN need to know? What is the farm? It's very similar in, in common thread. So I think I don't know if there is an opportunity, but you're talking about a director of care curriculum. We're talking about medical director curriculum. Are there some areas of commonality in those where we can really build on those dyads, triads, teams? So that's my thought. Sorry, I just wanted to add, actually, uh, Dr. Martin, I mean, it, honestly, it's so refreshing to hear you say that. <laughs> because, you know, I think it's something that long-term care has really been looking forward to. But as part of that is not just the training and the education, but is the experience, the, the, the placement part of it. So, you know, we've often had people, uh, nurses placed in year one and year two, which, you know, they don't get the same level experience, but they actually she could get a great experience in level, you know, in year three and four, you know, one with medication and two with leadership because you are it. I mean, if the physician isn't around, it's only the nurse that's, that's, that's in that making those decisions. So it's a great opportunity for nurses to experience some leadership skills and especially from a clinical perspective. Yeah. Uh, I'm just going to 
just change the discussion just a bit and get back to the how we change this paradigm, the, the kind of the state that we're in. Um, since this is a research conference, we, we, need, we really need a, a focused research agenda that will look on um, if we do, in fact, establish a specialty for long-term care, for directors of care, for phys uh, attending physicians, medical directors, um, if, if we do that, what effect does it have? What, if we can prove that relationship between, you know, the commitment and um, uh, competency and outcomes and get the attention of government, that's when things will change. Uh, if, we can, if we can prove not only deliver better outcomes, but we save the government money, then all of a sudden you get people's attention. That's, that's a, at least a decade-long uh, agenda, but <laughs> that's where we need to go. I've got a question here. Do you want to come to, um, do, there's a mic there behind you. I find it really interesting, the idea of, um, of the placements and so on forth to build that leadership right from the bottom up. As a long-term care sector, though, I mean, oftentimes we see acute care hospitals being teaching hospitals, but we don't see that in long-term care. We don't say that we're a, a teaching nursing home. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I really would love to see, when we're lo looking at that paradigm change, how do we as a long-term care sector build ourselves to be a teaching facility? I'm pretty sure we got some sure. responses here. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, we all have responses to that. Uh, yesterday, we, the conference was sponsored by Ontario uh, Learning Research and Innovation Centers, which are basically the re revitalized teaching nursing home concept. So it's a start. I think Ontario recognizes that um, we need to establish that. Uh, my, my estimation is that any home that acknowledges the need uh, and devotes resources, even modest resources, to education and research, which may be wrapped around quality improvement, uh, should be labeled a teaching nursing home, and we need to bring resources to bear. So we all need to do that. Um, but you're right, we need these centers that will attract the students, have the role models, you know, have the curriculum available. Um, but the LRIs are at least a first step from Ontario, and they should, you know, I think the government needs to be congratulated on that. Great question. Great insights there. <laughs> oh, I'll always talk about this topic. <laughs> um, uh, uh, right now we have 100 students that are uh, taking a family nursing course. Um, the curriculum is built on the Calgary Family Assessment Model, the CFAM, that some of you may be aware of. Um, it's a fabulous tool, but it's been developed by clinicians who work with children. Um, so therefore, the students come into this course expecting that they're going to learn about family nursing in the pediatric context. Now, the really interesting part is that of those 100 students, there are four, count them, four that are placed at sick kids. Everybody else is at Baycrest, is at Sunnybrook George Heaswing, is in Extendi Care, is at um, uh, um, oh, uh, Kensington Gardens, and they're all doing fourth year last term placements, and they're getting really turned on by the fact that they've got so much to learn. And while people have told them uh, uh, working with an older adult is very complex, you have the huge capacity for autonomous practice in a way you're not going to have in any other place. Believe me, guys, it's going to be wonderful. Um, to have this kind of experience still, there's a little bit of a uh, uh, um, uh, belief that these kinds of concerns, if I go to a long-term care placement my last term, will I ever be able to get hired by an acute care facility for my first job? I bet I won't. I'll be in a long-term care for the rest of my career. Now, um, most of us go, well, what would be the matter with that? You have no idea how fantastic. Look at all of these reports. Look at the um, the OLTCA um, website report. Um, uh, why not now? Look at the potential you would have for developing your practice capacity and making a difference in in, in collaboration, talking with people, understanding the literature. It's it's a fantastic experience. So um, there. I, 
I would agree that, you know, to build your capacity as an organization that is a, a, a target, a magnet for students, is to have those advanced practitioners who the ner that student can gravitate towards, ask questions of, and understand all the potential for how they could use their scope of practice to the, the nines in ways that they're not going to be able to use that in many other sectors for a whole variety of reasons. And um, uh, if you've got a library, um, if you've got uh, computer access um, for literature and that, that kind of thing, those are the sorts of things that students are absolutely amazed to learn about. And I have um, two students right now who are at Baycrest who are on the wound team and are having an absolute blast. <laughs> they are really turned on by this whole notion of collaboration, talking about things with respect to teams. There are other placements as well that the students are absolutely delighted with, and they, it, it, there are many different strategies that could be put in place to have the students continually attracted to want to go there. Then the students talk, and they're in a lineup to the central placement office, and they <laughs> say, I want this placement, because Susan told me it was fantastic. We'll take this one. Maybe more. Is there another comment or shall we? Uh, okay. Well, thank you. Did you hear the passion in that response? <laughs> Do we have the potential in this room? Absolutely. Here, here. Uh, a couple themes and we'll wrap for this session. Uh, I heard the word we. I heard the we once. I heard it twice. I heard it maybe 30 times. I started taking little notes. It is within us. It's the we here that are going to make the paradigm shift. We are at this table in this room having this dialogue because we are all committed and have a vision for something bigger, larger, and greater. I also heard uh, in my own mind the notion of interdependence, whether it be interprofessional or connected with the different key stakeholders or the notion of system-wide transformation. We all are interdependent on the ability to do that. So the more we get to know each other, the more we share what we know with each other and, and help each other be successful, the more we actually step ourselves to contribute because we can. We can get engaged in colleges. We can get engaged in universities, professional advising committees. We can you know, step up and volunteer when you already think you're too busy. Say yes. Together we will transform. And we are on that trajectory right now. On behalf of Ontario Long-Term Care Association, the Quality Committee, my name is Joanne Dykeman. It's been my pleasure to be your moderator today. Enjoy the rest of the sessions. Thank you.